Glad you joined me today. Today I'd like to talk about equity risk premiums and a dynamic forward-looking way of estimating the equity risk premium. What's the equity risk premium? It's that macro number that you use in every valuation. And it matters because the higher the equity risk premium, it's a premium you demand over and above the risk-free rate, the higher the rate of return you're acquiring on a risky asset. So holding all else constant, the higher the rate of return you demand on an investment, the less you'd be willing to pay up front. So higher risk premiums usually translate into lower values today. So the core idea that I'm going to use to back out the equity risk premium is I'm going to look at what you pay for an asset. And if I can see what you pay for an asset, I can back out of that pay what you pay, what you demand as an expected return. So let's keep this simple. Let's start with a very simple proposition. Let's assume that equities pay dividends and those dividends are constant forever. In other words, there's no growth. You buy a stock, you get a constant dividend forever. That, of course, is a perpetuity. The value of that stock is the expected dividend, which is the same as this year's dividend because there's no growth, divided by the cost of equity. So if you look at that equation and you play, do a little algebra, it turns out that the dividend yield on the stock then becomes the rate of return you can make on the stock because if you, you know, it, it's the dividend divided by the price of the stock today. And the equity risk premium then becomes the dividend yield minus the risk-free rate. So if we lived in a world with constant dividends and no growth, we could back out the equity risk premium for equities by looking at the dividend yield on stocks and subtracting out the risk-free rate from it. But that's not the world we live in. We live in a world where stocks are expected to grow. Let's take the simpler example first. Let's assume you have a stock with dividends expected to grow at a constant rate forever. That's a growing perpetuity. The value of that stock is the expected dividend next year, which is going to be a little higher than this year's dividend by the expected growth, divided by the difference between the cost of equity and the expected growth rate. This, of course, is the Gordon Growth Model. It's a model that's very widely used in valuation. Now, again, if you do a little algebra on this model, it turns out that your cost of equity can be written as the sum of two variables, the expected dividend yield, the expected dividend divided by the value of the stock today, plus the expected growth rate. Now, once you have that, of course, you can subtract out the risk-free rate from it to come up with the equity risk premium. So if we lived in a world with mature companies, and that's all we had. The dividend yield was 2%. The expected growth was 5%. Your cost of equity would be 7%. You could subtract out the risk-free rate from that to come up with an implied equity risk premium. Let's, let's, let's move one step further up the ladder. Let's assume you have companies that are growing at a rate faster than the, con than the stable growth rate, faster than the economy. If they're growing and they're investing in projects that earn the cost of capital, that's basically growth without value. In, in corporate finance, we, we measure the difference between the return that you make on your projects and your cost of funding these projects as an excess return. If you earn no excess returns, it actually turns out that the equation we had on the previous page still works, and it turns out that the earnings yield for a stock can be, become your cost of equity, and subtracting out the risk-free rate from it can give you the equity risk premium. So as an example, if, you're, uh, if you have you know, a price-earnings ratio of 10, that works out an earnings yield of 10%. You subtract out the risk-free rate from that, that in turn gives you the equity risk premium. Now, generalizing to any scenario, if you write the value of equity as a function of the expected cash flows you're going to get from that equity investment into the future, this is a more general discounted cash flow model. You have the value today, so let's assume you can solve, you can see what the price is today. Let's say you can estimate the expected cash flows in the future and you have a measure of the growth rate. The only unknown in this equation is the discount rate, right? So you can solve for that discount rate. It's like solving for an internal rate of return. That then becomes your cost of equity, and subtracting out the risk-free rate from that will give you an implied equity risk premium. So that's the basic setup we're going to use. And rather than beat this theory horse to death, I'm actually going to go to a spreadsheet and use it to actually estimate the equity risk premium for equities. And I'm going to use the S&P 500. Here are the inputs I will need to get the equity risk premium for the S&P 500. I will need the level of the index today. That's going to be pretty simple. I'll need a risk-free rate today, and that used to be simpler than it is today, but I'm going to use the US T-bond rate as my risk-free rate. And if you don't believe it's risk-free, take out whatever you think the default spread in it is. I need the dividends of the free cash flow equity that I had in my last year, because I don't know what it'll be in the future, but I can tell you what it was in the most recent 12 months. And I can get that in one of three ways. 
I can add up the free cash flows to equity, basically the potential dividends that these companies could have paid you know, so across the S&P 500 for each company. I can estimate how much each company could have paid in dividends. It's not difficult to do. It's a little tedious. And I add up the free cash flows to equity across all stocks. I could cheat and just take the dividends paid out plus whatever they invested in buybacks. And one of the key questions I will need to answer here is, should I go with the last 12 months number or should I try to normalize? It? What, what do you mean by normalize? Well, these numbers can go up and down. In a good year, you can have lots of cash flows. In a bad year, you can have very bad cash flows. Should I be normalizing that number? So that's a judgment call I will have to make. To get the expected growth in these cash flows, I can do one of two things. I can either look for an outside estimate and analysts project growth in earnings for the S&P 500. Maybe not for the period that I would like to, but for as long as I can get them. Or I can try to estimate what's called a fundamental or a sustainable growth based on how much these companies are putting back into their investments and what kind of return they're making, the return in equity and whatever they're retaining to come up with a fundamental growth rate. So what I'd like to do now is go to a spreadsheet that's on my website. And this is my implied equity risk premium spreadsheet from the start of 2000 and uh, from the start of February 2013. So let me go through the inputs one by one so you can basically see what I'm trying to do in this process. Let me make it a little bigger so it's a little easier to see. So this is from the start of February 2013. I'm going to try to update these numbers as of right now. What's right now? I mean, today is February 14th. It's Valentine's Day. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning, and the S&P 500, when I last checked, was about 1834.67. So let me update that number. So that should be the current level of the index. So that should be straightforward enough. That'll be different when you look at this spreadsheet, but enter that number. Then I give you some choices about the cash flows. And in fact, I give you six choices. You can use the dividends and the buybacks from the trailing 12 months. What those are actually are the last, the first three quarters of 2013 and the last quarter of 2012. You're saying, what happened to the last quarter of 2013? We don't know those numbers yet. So the number that you get from those trailing 12 months as cash flows is 84.16. And I'll give you a source where you can update these numbers on an ongoing basis. I've also computed what the average for this number has been if I look at the yield over the last decade. In other words, there have been good years and bad years over the last 10 years. And the average across the entire decade would have given me a cash flow of 90.52. I give you the average over the last five years, and it's a higher number. I, I also look at what the cash flow would have been if, if companies were returning roughly the percentage that they returned over the last decade roughly the percentage they returned over the last five years, or if they returned roughly that percentage, plus earnings had dropped to some average earnings over the last decade. So lots of choices, and you can see the numbers range the spectrum. A very conservative estimate, which assumes that earnings will drop back to a historical average and companies will go back to what they paid out before, would give you 66.08. The last 12 months is 84.16. So if you go in here, you'll see the choices. I'm going to stay with the trailing 12-month number, and you can always come back and change it if you feel like it. The next cell is a computer. So any cell that's green shaded is computed. Don't mess with it. Just leave it alone. Then I ask you, what is the expected growth rate? And here again, I give you five choices. You can use the historical earnings growth over the last decade. You can use the forecasted growth rate. It's called a bottom-up. And what these are are actually estimated growth rates for the individual companies in the S&P 500 that analysts are projecting average out. The problem with this growth rate usually is that these estimates tend to be upward biased and they tend to be growth rates and earnings per share. You're saying, so what? Because I'm counting buybacks as part of my cash flows, using earnings per share growth will end up double counting those buybacks because when I buy back shares, the number of shares decreases. So that number of 7.44% is probably way too high a number. Then I give you a top-down forecasted growth rate. What these are are growth rates from analysts, but these analysts track the entire index. They don't do individual companies. And these forecasts tend to be much more unbiased. And that number is about 4.44. And that's, in fact, you know, one of the numbers I track is, the, is, the, is, is, is that I have top-down number. And that's what I'm actually going to use in my forecast. Now, you might not trust analysts at all, in which case I give you two other choices. 
One is to estimate what the growth will be based on how much these companies are reinvesting and what their return on equity is. So what I do is I take the current return on equity for S&P 500 companies, look at what they're reinvesting, and the growth rate I get is a much smaller number. So if you prefer that number, you can go in and enter that number, make that choice. So the choices are listed up here. I've gone with the top top down estimate. The next cell, as I said, is a green shaded cell, which means whatever I chose as my as my source, in this case, the top down estimate is the growth rate I'm going to be using. Then I ask, what's the risk free rate? That's a number that I need to update. And as of February 14th at 10, 10 o'clock, the T bond rate was 2.74%. So I'm going to update that. Then I ask you whether, you know, if in computing an intrinsic value of the index, what you'd like to use, let me come back to that because that has nothing to do with the implied premiums. That's to allow you to actually figure out whether stocks collectively are underpriced or overpriced. And let's work through now what the implied premium is. To compute the implied premium, here's what I'm going to try to do. First, I'm going to take the cash flow. In this case, 84.16 is my base year cash flow. And I'm going to let it grow over time using those top-down estimates. I'm going to discount those cash flows back to today, including my cash flow beyond year five, which I assume, and this is, a, this is an assumption that I, 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 I adhere to fairly religiously because it takes a huge weight off my shoulders, is after year five, I'm assuming that whatever my risk-free rate is, is also going to be my growth rate. So in effect, I'm assuming a growth rate of 4.59% for the next five years and then 2.74% beyond. You can change that, but be very careful because that's your growth rate in perpetuity. And if you mess with it too much, you can completely throw off your analyses. So in this case, I have my cash flows for the next five years and 2.74% is my growth rate beyond. I have a present value. Now, what I want to do is check to see what discount rate will make the present value, in this case, cell B, B40, equal to whatever my level of the index is today, 1834.67. Now, I can do trial and error, but there's a much quicker way in which I can get there. There's a function called the gold seek function in Excel. So go to the gold seek function, set B, the cell that you want to set equal to your current level of the index is the cell B40. You want to set it equal to 1834.67, which is what the index is at today, by changing the risk premium cell. So is everybody clear on what I'm doing? Basically, I am trying to get the spreadsheet to solve for that discount rate that will make the present value of my cash flows equal to the level of the index today. So you ready? Let's see what happens. If I hit OK, it comes back with this. Say OK again. There's my implied equity risk premium as of February 14th of 2014. That's as updated as you can get. That number will change on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. So by the time you actually watch the spreadsheet, both the S&P 500 and the T-bond rate will have changed. If you're watching it in the near term, it might, the, the rest of the inputs might not have changed. You can just change those two numbers. But if you're watching this much later, you probably want to update the buybacks number, the growth rate number. Let me give you a couple of sources that I find useful. Here's the first one. This is actually a press release that S&P puts out every three months, and they're pretty religious about when these come out. They come out around December 15th, March 15th, June 15th, and September 15th, give or take a week. And what they list are the buybacks in the most recent quarter, right? So th this is basically on Dece the December 2000, this is the most recent, as of February 2014, released from the S&P 500. It's a PDF file. So you're saying, what am I going to do with this? If you go down this file, it'll actually list out what the buybacks were in the, in the most recent quarter, in the most recent four months. So that's how I update the numbers. As I go to the S&P website, I look for this press release, and I update these numbers. And as I said, they get updated not as often as I'd like them to be. I'd like them to be updated every minute of every day. They get updated once every three months. So that's where I get the buyback and the dividends number to get the trailing 12-month number. Now for the earnings number, I go back to the S&P website, and if you go to the S&P 500 index portion of the S&P website, there's actually a link there to S&P 500 earnings, and this actually is a pretty good website. It's a pretty good uh, spreadsheet because it lists out a great deal of the information we need 
now valuation. So it reports the earnings in the S&P 500 for the most recent 12 months. It also gives you estimates of future earnings. And remember, we talked about top-down and bottom-up. The top-down are the estimates based on individual analysts tracking individual companies. The bottom, I'm sorry, the bottom-up are the estimates based on individual company uh, analysts tracking individual companies. And the top-down are the estimates that I'm using, that come from analysts who track the earnings in the en entire S&P 500. They give forecasts for usually one or two years. You will still have to fill out the rest of the of the process of the rest of the inputs for the growth rate. I, there is no one place that I go. I go to Google search. There are a couple of websites that I find useful for forecasts, but it's a patchwork of estimates that I use to come up with that growth rate for the next five years. But those are the numbers that drive my overall implied equity risk premium. So let's review. Open up the spreadsheet, and that's the first step. You'll see the spreadsheet open up. Play with the numbers. Change the cash flows. Change the growth. You know, try it. Try it. Change the risk-free rate. See what happens. Then update the numbers. Uh, and as I said, the numbers you're going to see are going to be different than the numbers that I've just put in. Update the numbers. Use the goal seek function. Solve for it. What does this tell me? Basically, this is what I read out of this. Remember the risk-free rate at the time of doing this was 2.74%. The 5.02% risk premium is over and above the 2.74%. So what the spreadsheet is calculating is a 7.76% expected return. It's saying, look, given what you're paying for stocks right now, you can expect to make a 7.76% expected return. Is that the right return or the wrong return? That's not a judgment I'm, want, I, I'm willing to make at this point in time. But with the, the market price that I observe, 7.76% is the expected return on stocks, or the cost of equity, the implied cost of equity. Subtracting out the risk-free rate gives me an implied equity risk premium of 5.02%. Two things. One is, in valuing individual companies for the rest of this month, I should be using an equity risk premium for mature markets, as, and I'm classifying the U.S. as a mature market, of about 5%. So that's how it plays in, in valuing individual companies. Now you're saying, what if I don't think the 5.02% is a reasonable premium? That's where the rest of the spreadsheet comes in. You can go in and replace that number with what you think is a more reasonable risk premium. What you're doing when you do this is you're pricing the entire market. So if you look here, I've essentially replaced the 5.02% with a 4.9% premium, which is the average implied premium over the last decade. And if you look at the first part of the spreadsheet, I now compute what the, the level of the index will be with that inputted premium of 4.9%. And what I get is a level of the index of 1879, which is much higher than the level of the index that I observe right now. And in fact, if you look at the, the I've also computed an intrinsic P and intrinsic, you know, uh, adjusted P, but that's not the key. It's a little higher than the existing level of the index, which means that if I'm making a judgment on the overall value of equities, my conclusion is stocks are slightly undervalued, not overvalued. So again, I'm not trying to push you into that conclusion, but I'm saying you can use the spreadsheet to draw the conclusions you want. So I, I, the best way to kind of get a better sense of this is to, is to, is to play with it. And I hope you get a chance to do that. Thank you very much for listening.